Welcome, welcome, welcome to the David Langford Lecture. Um, we are absolutely de delighted to have with us Anna, Anna, <laughs> I'm going to stuff this up, Anna Elf Hellstrom <laughs> from Chalmers University to join us to spotlight her research, uh, in particular the, the conference paper that she submitted entitled The Dark Side of Collaboration. So for those of you, I highly, highly recommend that you read the conference paper that is actually available to us all now from this, uh, from this uh, interface in the files download uh, box, which you can find on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Alongside, you can also find some information, some background information about David Langford and why we have dedicated this event in his honor. Um, uh, as well as that, you will find a pr the presentation that uh, accompanies the conference paper. And that presentation has al also been uploaded onto YouTube. Under our, um, our YouTube channel, <laughs> we are with the 21st century now, um, we have a YouTube channel in its ARCOM hyphen online. If you'd like to become a subscriber, I would love to see 170 subscribers by the end of tomorrow. Um, but you will also find her presentation as well as other fabulous tidbits on the channel. So the only, uh, I would like to give the uh, um, pass over to Anna, but before I do, just for those who just joined, <laughs> again to, warn you <laughs> this will be a highly interactive uh, session so please get your interactive social hat on Anna over to you thank you Vivian for this lovely introduction uh, just to check everybody can hear me perfect yeah and uh, then just a short few very carefully selected and um, gift wrapped words so you know where I'm come from and you know who I am for those of you who I don't already know and those who I will get to know during this hour we have together. So my name is Anna Fellström. I am currently researching project management in large scale infrastructure projects at Chalmers University in Gothenburg, Sweden. And my past is in architecture and urban planning with a side dish of uh, urban planning, economics and design thinking. And uh, as Vivian already mentioned, this will be quite an interactive experience for us all. And uh, I'm fine with you taking a walk during this or, you know, knitting or having dinner, but please be prepared to, to participate. So uh, after this year, we have all had, you know, it's a much more constructive approach to participation. So rather than to stay silent on the sidelines. And uh, so without further ado, over to my uh, presentation. And just a second for the screen sharing to start. So it's really great to see so many of you with me here at this uh, David Langford lecture. And it is a very great honor to stand here in front of my screen today. And I really hope we'll have a, a marvelous time together and uh, if you have any comments or questions, you know, please ask them or uh, write them in the chat if you don't want to interrupt what I'm saying at that moment. And uh, Vivian has promised to keep track of, of the chat for me. So uh, without further ado, on with the show. And we'll start right off the bat with a tiny offering of interactivity. So uh, you get to choose what we will actually put the major focus on during this lecture. So will we focus on the topic of my paper, the dark side of collaboration, or should we take a small look at collaboration in construction? And you get to choose this in Menti. So I'm sure that you all are all very familiar with uh, menti.com. And uh, so the code is 3071 47 36. And I'm going to give you just a few moments to, to get the code into Menti and get to voting. At the moment, it's six votes for the dark side, one, one vote for collaboration. Oh, two votes for collaboration.
10 votes for the dark side, still two for collaboration, 12, okay, fine. Uh, I think that we have uh, chosen by an overwhelming majority <laughs> because the votes keep piling in for the dark side of collaboration. So that is what we will focus on today. And uh, just a word of warning, um, I won't talk only about the paper, the dark side, and uh, because you know this is a, a construction management conference after all. And uh, if you want to read my paper, uh, it's available in this event. And if you want to see the presentation I prepared for the conference, as mentioned, it will be available on, on YouTube. So uh, please check that out as well. And then just a moment, I have to remember to do some small changes because I uh, have prepared two presentations or two different modes of presentations. So, and yeah. So we will uh, now get to the second part of the first introductory collaborative or um, interactive part of this uh, presentation. And I hope you still have the Menti page up because you should hopefully now see the second question, which is what color is this dress? And because the picture is a bit blurry, I'm just going to put it up in my presentation as well. And I will give you 15 seconds to answer starting from now. and 15 seconds are gone, like that. So um, I can tell you that 21 people think that this dress is white and gold, and six people think that it's blue and black. And I'm sure many of you recognize the dress from its internet fame in 2014. And it's interesting that the opinions on this are so divided because this dress is, after all, a case where we can have one true answer. You know, we can just look up the dress itself in, in different lighting and see who was correct. And uh, I happen to have the right answer. It's the six people who think it's blue and black that are correct in this case. It's actually a blue and black dress, but the lighting makes us think it's, it's different colors. So, but this isn't a really easy case to, to have an opinion and, and to to discuss what what's real and what's what what the truth is, so to say. But what happens when we have something that's not so easy to to define or to discuss? So, in order to to try this out, this to have something not very easy to define or or to discuss, I am going to put you into breakout rooms, and you will have uh, five minutes and you will have a task in your breakout room. So for in five minutes, you have to, or I would very much appreciate if you would write a limerick on Arkham. So an Arkham themed limerick in five minutes in your breakout room. And uh, if you could please share the limerick in the chat uh, when you're done, that would be great because then we can all share in this Arkham limerick creativity bonanza. But just a moment and I will share the rooms. So we will have very random rooms just so you get to know some people and I will start them. I hope that everybody are back from the breakout rooms now. So uh, remember to post your limerick either in the chat or down there. You can also go to, to the same Menti page. There's an uh, Orcom limericks page open there now. So you can also post it there if you want to. Um, just so you know. Oh, I love the first one. Presenting online is a chore. The audience you don't want to bore. We sit our screens, typing links like fiends. We next meet in Glasgow next year for sure. Oh, that's lovely.
Oh, the second one uh, on menti.com is also great. Arcom is a construction management network that helps us put things into a framework. We innovate, co-create, and manage to collaborate so that we can manage construction like a clockwork. <laughs> there once was an annual event that didn't require a tent. Its name was Arcom, and they all got along, but occasionally needed to vent. Yeah. There once was a conference called Arcom, where hangovers were often overcome. But we then went online, where there was no more wine, so we wait for Glasgow to come. I sense a theme, because we have the fifth one. There once was a conference called Arcom, where hangovers were there overcome. Now we are online, there is no more wine, so we wait for Scotland and fun. Oh, these are lovely. Thank you so much. And, uh, but as I hope you noticed, this sudden collaboration isn't very easy. And uh, I guess you had quite differing ideas and opinions on how to write the limerick and exactly what parts of this great conference to celebrate true poetry. And uh, this is, of course, very and a high degree of negotiation, interactivity and interdependence. And as both the question about the dress and the limerick construction showed, a common understanding as well as structural symmetry and interactivity, and then not to mention interdependence, can be extremely difficult to achieve if we see things in completely different ways or even slightly different ways. So if all these people who are working together in a single project have different goals and those goals aren't the same as the project goals. How can they reach the common understanding necessary for the project to succeed? And what makes it harder is that I find that the definition of collaboration itself is quite all over the place. So when looking into the literature on collaboration in construction, a lot of articles are using for me, kind of confusing language. So they use collaboration, cooperation, and coordination almost interchangeably. And there seems to be a general consensus on that there's some sort of hierarchy with collaboration at the top, and then the other concepts starting with co below collaboration. But the exact order of the terms and the contents are still quite unclear. And that leads to my question, so what is collaboration? What is, what is it useful for? And there are, of course, definitions, such as the one I used in my paper, namely that collaboration is shared, interactively developed understanding of the rules and norms governing the context. But I think that collaboration goes deeper than that. And uh, just a word of warning, the next picture will be slightly morbid. So, you know, turn off your screen, uh, you can just listen to my, my voice if you want to for a minute or so. And um, so if old bones aren't your thing, you know, look away. So welcome to the slightly morbid section. And this is the part where I'm kind of glad that this lecture doesn't take place during the dinner, because then I probably wouldn't have shared this lovely old person. But I think it's quite an amazing picture, because except teaching us about old humans, um, Old bones are really good at showing human culture as well. And human culture has always included collaboration and social bonds. And I'm going to just read straight from the webpage where I found this call, just so you know, because they could do very nicely. So uh, this is a Dmnasi skull from Georgia, Georgia, another type of hominin to us. Notice the jaw, when we lose our teeth, uh, over time, our jawbone heals the gaps making it smooth. So when archaeologists discover skulls centuries later, they can tell whether the tooth was lost after death, as the bone didn't grow to cover the hole, or during the individual's life. And the majority of this jaw has healed, so this person would have lived a number of years with basically no teeth. The age of this skull, according to Wikipedia, is 1.8 million years. So this means that millions of years ago, this person had a diet with soft, easy foods, and that others in the group would have known this, they would have understood this, and they would have helped by specializing their foraging for this one individual. Or, in the words of the webpage where I found this, 
someone would have had to chew up this person's food for them every day, multiple times for years. So almost two million years ago, people had this shared, interactively developed understanding of the rules and norms governing the context. So they collaborated. And now we are going to jump forward two million years approximately to slightly more chaotic modern collaborative settings. So um, I'm not sure how many of you know uh, Twitch plays Pokemon, but according to Wikipedia, it's a social experiment and a channel on the video game live streaming website Twitch, consisting of a crowdsource attempt to play Game Freaks and Nintendo's Pokemon video games by parsing commands sent by users through the channel's chat room. And it also holds the Guinness World Record for having the most participants on a single player online video game with 1,165,140 players. So in short, it's a collaborative online game where an internet robot plays the popular game Pokemon. And there's no plan or coordinating mechanism, but the players somehow manage to play this game. And that just goes through the commands in the chat, which are then translated for the robot and show up for the players. And this game has been running since 2014 and has led to a number of scientific articles on both the role changes in game industry, but also on collaboration and social dynamics. And here we have two other very collaborative games with slightly more purpose and slightly more goal than Twitch plays Pokemon. So on the left, we have Pokemon Go, and on the right, we have Harry Potter Wizards Unite. And these are both games where the individual player has a personal goal in the game, but to reach that, they need to cooperate and collaborate. And maybe that's not the deep personal connection, but they're still sharing resources and risk, and they are acting interdependently to a degree. And in Pokemon Go, you have to gather your friends, to beat strong monsters. And in Wizards Unite, you need to gather people with different skill sets in order to be the most efficient at beating monsters. And both games lack the strategic intent of traditional collaboration and cooperation, you know, the kind of we find in project management. But I would still argue that these are highly collaborative experiences. And so my question still stands, what is collaboration and what is it useful for? Because humans and social relationships and striving towards a common goal seems to be key ingredients in this. But as with all things, the right measure of something is very important. You, can just, you can't just heap things into a, into a pile and hope that, oh, you know, if we just take enough, then, then everything will be fine. Because everything is dangerous in the right or the wrong dose. And with the rise of collaboration in literature and management books and our discourse in general, there is probably something here too that's worth looking at. And then this leads me first to the benefits of collaboration, because we all know that there are many of those, else why would you, you know, write pages and pages about collaboration? And there are a lot of benefits you have increased creativity, you have increased perspective and innovation, teams educate and learn from each other. Um, this uh, social uh, feeling breeds engagement and productivity. Well-oiled teams are agile and flexible, they support each other. You know, it, you have improved mental health in the, in the project or in that context and, well, people like to collaborate, so teamwork is attractive to, to talent. And, I know we chose to focus on the dark side of collaboration, but I still want to say a few words about construction, you know, with uh, the whole ORCOM conference. And I'm going to cut down a bit on the content. So if you want to know more, you know, please read my paper. But just to give you a frame of reference. So, oh, that wasn't. Uh, so construction has always involved collaboration because we have these complex projects with loads of involved parties. So we need some sort of mechanism to get every, all people working together. And today we also have the hope that collaboration will lead to improved project outcomes and that it will lower the, the risk of cost overrun and, and lower the risk of delays and facilitate efficient problem solving, which then in turn will lessen the risk of costly legal battles. And these are all core concepts in collaborative construction management models who are 
characterized by early involvement of key actors and joint decision making and the sharing of resources, risks and responsibilities. And these are also the collaborative models which are the focus of my research. And the practicalities of these collaborative project delivery models or CPDM models rely on the interplay between the project organization and the process as, as is uh, defined in the governing contract, but particularly on the social relationships. And I have looked at these through network theory, since the network view allows for in-depth understanding of behavior and ties between people in these project networks. And the network is shaped by both the individual actors partaking in the project and their role in the project organization, but also by the organizations who are contracted to, to deliver the finished product. So you have a lot of different goals and a lot of different drivers to take into consideration when discussing project collaboration. And uh, close social relationships can assist in coordinating adap uh, adaptation and adjustment within the network, which then helps in shifting the perspectives to cultivating long-term relationships rather than chasing short-term gains. So, you know, moving more towards the supporting each other and, and looking to the project's benefit and not only, you know, my own goals. But however, although benefits of collaboration makes these collaborative models attractive to use, there are especially two aspects of collaboration rela related challenges that, that are very little discussed in current literature. So first we have the homogeneity of social networks. And secondly, we have the creation of in and out groups and their related group thing, that, group thing that this brings with it. And both these issues were visible in my research. So uh, I'm not going to go into detail into my paper here. And if you're interested, please read it. But if you have read it, this picture is familiar to, the, to you. And it depicts the main relationships between actor organizations, between the client, the contractor, and the design engineer. And uh, the orange arrow, the, the whole arrow, is the strongest rela relationship. And in all the cases I looked at, two of the three actors got together very, very early in the project, and they developed strong relationships which I call social ties in my paper. And these ties could be classed as who were embedded or too, too strong simply uh, because they were creating in groups and out groups in the project network, which in turn restricted the participation of one of the actors by limiting their access to the network structure. And the Pro these problems start to grow when either the social relationships aren't working properly or when they are working too well. So here we have an illustration of this problematic process. So, you know, people find each other, but then they, they live in this little bubble and then you have a problem because this early relationship between actors in the in the project I looked at made later inclusion of additional people or additional actors quite difficult, which was seen during uh, phase two or, or the actual construction phase in all of my cases. And this restricted, this restricted network uh, was seen in, in my first major case where they had very strong intra-organizational ties, which were much stronger than the inter-organizational ties, natural of course, but this was making information exchange difficult and very reliant on meetings and processual or uh, contractual aspects. And in, in my second big case I was looking at, then the ties were more in balance, although there were some difficulties between some of the actors, but it also made it, also made it difficult for, for people to join in afterwards. And these, um, strong ties restrict information flow and create well in groups and out groups and this is interesting to consider especially in long-term major projects which we have quite a lot of in construction where a certain relocation or reassignment of people is to be expected during the project's life cycle and another aspect related to social ties and to collaboration is the need for the project manager to rely very much on interpersonal relationships. So these, what I term strong ties for efficient leadership, 
because they often, especially in the Nordic setting, lack traditional tools to manage project participants originating from other organizations. And while strong ties are reported to bring several benefits, such as rapid information exchange and, tr and trust, they also carry risks restricting network development, and this becomes really relevant in large-scale projects. So I'm going to illustrate this by sharing a personal anecdote regarding this problem. So one of my first real jobs, you know, everything was completely new. I was on the lowest rung on the ladder. They were really lovely people, very, you know, friendly, open, took me in as one of the team. They uh, even bought me a new coffee cup when my disappeared from the office kitchen. This is this is the uh, not the actual cup, but it was this lovely moving cup. But then um, we got a new colleague who had ex extensive experience in some other fields related to ours, but not you know exactly the right. And she was an amazing person, really driven, really motivated, but she never really got along with our team leader. There was nothing personal; it was just like a chemistry mismatch. And all the official routes that were supposed to help. All, all like just led in circles and so she quit she you know she found a much better job in a different field seems really happy when when i checked last on her has had a couple of promotions and so on but the problem here which i'm i'm sure you've seen as well in in your career and and in your life was that we had this highly cohesive theme we had really strong relationships all were smart and capable people, you know, everybody were working their hardest, but they were quite unable to work with outside influences. So you had this person from, from outside the field that came with all these new ideas and, and new ways to do things. And people were just like, you know, hedgehogging, like, no, no, I'm not going to do that. And uh, my theory regarding this particular incident or situation was that, I was, you know, young and innocent. I didn't know what to do. So I could mold myself to the team and, and to the team's, uh, you know, needs or wishes, the team culture. But the new colleague, she had loads of experience. She had strong opinions. And so she had a much harder time. And this is exactly what I'm talking about in my paper. So over embedded ties in a classical organizational network they can constrain information flow and hinder innovations from arising. And these close social ties are also easier, maybe not the easiest, but it, it's very much easier to create these with people who are similar to yourself. And then when people in a group are too similar, innovation and new ideas are, are stifled. And too close social ties can therefore hinder information sharing and the rise of innovations if not managed properly. And so we come to the dark side of collaboration or two cohesive themes. So we have quite a lot of different challenges or, or problems here. So we have uh, too much team spirit, which can lead to insularity. You know, members are losing sight of the team's role and function in the, lar in the larger picture. And um, a highly cohesive team has a difficult time accepting new members, as I saw in my in my uh, earlier workplace. And norms and ground rules can become rigid, and prior decisions may become, you know, immutable. You can't you can't do things in a new way because this is how it's always been done. And uh, a highly cohesive team can feel powerful, but they can also believe that you know nobody else can understand what they know. And then, of course, not in my backyard, you have this uh, problem of ownership and transfer and, uh, and a reluctance to share and to be influenced by other individuals and groups. You know, that's a very good idea, but we are not doing that, not, not on our turf. So the dark side of collaboration discussed in the article are the restrictions collaboration can place on a network. So we have over embedded social ties and two similar actors can hinder conflict resolution and the introduction of new ideas. And well, as our respondents rem remarked, it's easier to, to go to those you know for help before approaching someone new. And well, of course, this implies trust. You know, you want to approach this cer certain person, this actor, but it also restricts the new input you can get because you know this actor, you know how they are likely to act. 
And the benefit of a functioning collaborative project network lies in the balance between different viewpoints and actors. And that's also what I saw in, in the project I looked at. So you had both these problems with suboptimization and turnover. So, you know, too much team spirit, too much insularity, you know, a kind of a difficult time accepting new members or a difficult time, how would you say, maybe preparing for them. So the ones who were there had problems, you know, creating processes that would allow new members to have a, a you know, better access to the, to the project network. And then these, uh, these other things were not a focus of our, of our research, but uh, I think if I, if I dig into the data, I will find something for this as well, but that was not the focus of, of this paper. So now I have, yes, I have another break, breakout room session for you. So uh, once again, you can then write the, the answer either in the chat or, or in the Menti. But now you have a little more time, you have seven minutes to think about how we can minimize the dark side of collaboration in construction management. So I will put you into the breakout rooms and I really hope that it's the same ones. No, it's not. Well, you will get to know new people. How nice. And I will start the rooms. Welcome back. And uh, I hope you had a, a interesting discussion. And now I would actually like to invite uh, invite somebody from every group to to you know present a short summary about your thoughts. I'm happy to deliver our groups first. Go for it, Chrissy. Um, so Florence was talking about subordinate structures and having like a bigger idea to get everybody to work towards. Um, and also she spoke about brand identity and getting everyone behind a brand or an idea. And we did talk about whether that would be conflicting if you had like a strong brand within a company and you're on a joint venture. Then Pika put into place some really strong rules around how to actually make that happen. Um, so things like joint openings, reminding people at the beginning of every day, having alliances so you can hear different voices. And the Magic and Hemming really talked about that talking part of it, enabling people to have conversations with one another. And I personally added um, my thoughts around ensuring a strong perception of justice and fairness on the project. So making sure everyone feels that distribution is fair, that procedure is fair, that they've had a chance to have everything listening to, and that that interaction is fair as well. Can I go next? Go for it. Okay. Um, in in our group, we got into a discussion about in groups and out groups, and our, our solution is that in groups have to recognise that it's their job to include more people, um, and in order to do that, they need to understand their own relationship mechanisms um, and take responsibility for them. So um, to keep it short, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. That's great. Yeah. Can, Another can team, I, one of the other, like, Metallica. Can I, can I go next? One of the other teams. Yes. Uh, so I was in a group with uh, Lian Chi Poker, Daniela Troje, and uh, Philippa Boyd. Uh, and that was really interesting because we have three women and one man. So the first thing we thought was to stop the in-group in construction management, we should boot, boot out all the men. And uh, that would be quite interesting. Um, but just to follow up on uh, David Boyd's point, uh, firstly, we need to be aware that there is a problem with the dark side of uh, collaboration. Uh, and I think the example was given where whenever we ask students to form groups, they always have a tendency to want to choose their friends because they think they would collaborate better. And maybe that's the kind of mindset that needs to kind of change. And maybe final uh, thing is that now that we're doing online communication, uh, perhaps uh, we ought to pay attention to uh, body language. Uh, you know, it's much more coordinated now. Uh, perhaps uh, Zoom could have a function where they automatically boot people out uh, after every so often. 
uh, that could be quite interesting. I don't know if I've missed out anything else from my group. Good. Thank you, Paul. Um, I think two other groups, right? We've done now three. Yeah. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? Maybe yes. I can go. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, so mm -hmm. I don't remember all the names of the people that were in my group. Uh, but uh, um, there were three, they call themselves um, older guys that knew each other very well. So um, one of the first reflections was that maybe we have some dark, uh, a dark side of collaboration here because, um, you know, they know they have known each other for a long time and so on. So they started talking, but then they were like inviting me and the others um, um, to share. And so we started to talk about like how important it is to be open and uh, um, and also maybe awareness of the dark sides can uh, help um, overcoming uh, the bad things that it brings with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Tyson very well. And one could, last group, right? Well, could I, could I just add to, to Stina's report? Because I, I was one of those old fogies in the group. <laughs> and I... We had this person who came into our, our group, you know, I think she was an engineer, but she actually came in and joined our group. You know, she came from the dark side to be part of the in group. I'm saying this, I'm saying this tongue in cheek. Um, but but I just, I suppose for us, as we were discussing, it just it dawned on me in terms of our discussions that, you know, how, how we can be disrupted in, in our engagements by actual, you know, events happening you know, and, and contributions. And, 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 and the person that came in was Vivian to give us some news that we were a minute from the end. But I just, I'm using it as a, as a kind of metaphor, if you like, to say that, you know, groups can be actually infiltrated, you know, and, and having an awareness of that dark side is, is important. You know, and I, and I know Stina has, has kind of brought that through already in the discussions. So just to add that to, to the, the flavor of the mix. I like this this uh, this image of me infiltrating different groups. That makes me sound like a spy. I like that. No, no, <laughs> you're not a spy. No. <laughs> the last, the final group. <laughs> Unless my calculation is wrong, that that could poss be possible. <laughs> there should be one group um, that hasn't spoken. I think. No. They went off early to the pub. <laughs> okay. Well, well, okay. <laughs> That's fine as well. And uh, thank you very much for your summaries and, and very thought provoking and, and interesting comments. Because then we have the final page. So now what? Uh, because collaboration isn't an easy topic, as you all know. Although it, it is a very easy word to add to an article or a project management model. And one thing that I would like to invite you to think a bit about is that today when we have two, way too many days, a year and a half of COVID behind us, you know, which has changed our tools and models regarding how we interact with each other and how we can collaborate. You know, we are sitting here in a, in a virtual meeting instead of face to face, which would be so much nicer. Uh, so my question to you is, you know, what will you do tomorrow? So during the second day of ORCOM, how can, you be more collaborative, but not too isolating in this setting. Wonderful. I know that now, guys, I know that we are just spot on uh, 5.15, but I think we can indulge ourselves in just a couple of questions because I know there are some in the chat. So if, if we are very quick and if, if none of you object, of course, if you have somewhere else you need to be, then please feel free to um, uh, uh, to vacate the room. But very quickly, a question from Chrissy about, um, she has done work on in-groups and out-groups, but from the perception of fairness. So she wanted to, um, understand whether or not so she found that employees who found the organizations to be unfair were more likely to align themselves with the in groups does this um, uh, is this reflective of did you see that at all in your research mm -hmm. 
Uh, well, we didn't look at fairness per se, but uh, I think that would be a very interesting thing to to look at more in, in detail because my gut feeling is that it totally is that way so that if you think this is unfair, then you would be more likely to you know, go for the other option or have views compatible with that. But, uh, but that's not some, something we looked at. So I, I really can't say, you know, uh, I really can't say with a scientific backing that yes, that agrees. But my gut feeling is that yes, that would be the case. Excellent. Uh, very quickly moving on. I'm trying to fit in as many as I can. <laughs> Pippa says, Pippa has a comment really. Um, I wonder if there is also a dimension of the joiner having to be aware of the issues. Yeah, I think that's ac that's actually something that came up a bit in, in our interviews so that people mentioned that, that, that there there is this problem of, um, especially when you have because um, a lot of these projects use some sort of collaborative space, a big room or, or co-located office or something. And then there were quite a few people who mentioned that it was hard to become part of the team when they, when they weren't at the collaborative space as often as, as the other people. So, they're, so it seemed that if you, if you have this awareness, then you can, of, of course, then you can do something about that because when these people were talking about that, that was also something that the project leadership was talking about. So, you know, this is a problem. So how do we solve this problem? Excellent. Thank you. Um, Libby, I know you've got one up your sleeve. Would you like to ask a question? I think maybe given that the time is short, instead of, I, I, I will put it in the form of a question, but it, it's really almost a research agenda question. So maybe I won't ask Anna to, or Anna's welcome to, to respond, but I, I was asked, to, I've, I've had the, the privilege of reading the paper beforehand, and I was told to prepare some questions, and Anna had asked me to think a bit about the definition of collaboration. So maybe one way to kind of pull this together is to think about the research, looking forward, what kind of research agenda does Anna's work contribute to? Because one of the things I'm quite, that I've been thinking about a lot lately was how do we, encourage more collective research agendas within ARCOM or within construction management research because we often have really good papers that nobody then picks up on and a lot of the projects that people take on are not projects that one person can actually realize they're really a step in a collective research agenda so my comments are kind of in that spirit um and i think you know i find anna's paper very very convincing as a study of strong and weak ties and i'm but if one extends the question of whether, whether strong ties is collaboration and weak ties is not collaboration, I get a little bit less comfortable. And so there's a few thoughts I had. And one is I wonder whether we really need such a radical distinction between traditional projects, which are kind of being presented, at least in terms of the framing of the paper, as not collaboration or less collaboration. And these formally collaborative projects, which are the object of her research. And again, this doesn't discount the research at all, but it seems to me that there's no way a building could get built without collaboration. You know, we're all used to talking about how construction projects involve very heterogeneous group of actors, skills, professions, organizations, disciplines, et cetera, et cetera. So the very fact that any building gets built involves some kind of collaboration. It may not, there may be different types of collaboration or collaboration along different issues or dimensions, but I wonder what happens to the research agenda if we open it up a little bit and instead of asking about collaboration versus not collaboration, because I don't actually think there's any not completely no collaboration in any project, we ask about what are the different ways of thinking about types of collaboration and what would be some of the interesting questions that would emerge. Um, so I think Anna's paper, I think I like it a great deal and I think it's made a really major contribution as we can tell from the conversation. And it's done that partially for me because she's picked a theory which focuses her attention on one very particular aspect, which is this issue of strong and weak ties, which is really drawing attention to the nature of the informal relations within the project. Um, so I, I guess I wonder whether even within this focus on strong and weak ties, whether the nature of collaboration or the dynamic might vary along other dimensions in addition. For example, I wonder if the dynamic around collaboration varies depending on whether the task at hand is seen as essential to the project or is secondary. You know, we, there's a lot of 
number of the papers in the conference now are about sustainability or health and safety. And one observation is that people say these are topics that sometimes fall off the agenda um, because they're not seen as being as important as time or cost. Or So maybe there's different types, the dynamic of collaboration and the importance of strong and weak ties might vary with either the type of project, but also the type of issue. I mean, another thing that the question that it raises for me is there's implicit in Anna's paper, and it, it's absolutely, this is not a criticism because it's consistent with the idea of strong ties being collaboration and her focus on strong ties, but there is an implication that somehow collaboration involves strong ties and homogeneous groups and similarity. And certainly I know Paul Chan will, is familiar with, there's a lot of work in sociology of science about collaboration in science between very multidisciplinary groups of people from very different disciplines. And they make a very strong argument that collaboration doesn't, doesn't actually depend on shared understanding. Collaboration doesn't depend on being similar. And that there's often very weak ties which allow for an exchange of information, which is very practical in terms of problem solving, but is quite a different model of collaboration than the strong tie model. So I think that the paper opens up a whole, a really interesting research agenda that would help us you know, in construction management for me, and I'm giving a speech, but I'm going to shut up in a minute, I promise. Um, I, was, I was going to ask you, where's the question? I'm going to stop in a second. But I do think yeah, we have a tendency to accept words from the industry or from policymakers as if they're the phenomena that's of interest, like collaboration or integration, and they're good things. We all want more integration. We all want more collaboration. And actually, as researchers, the question might be, what aspects of construction management are, is there collaboration or not? And how, what's behind that word? Because the word is so general, it actually encompasses a wide variety of things. Me? So now I'll be quiet. And this is not, this is a question for Anna if she wants to answer it. But it's also a plea for us to kind of begin thinking about building on each other's work. There, now I'm done, Vivian. <laughs> So that was quite a, I, I feel bad now because it's a final question. That's, that's a whopper. That's really a whopper. But it talks, it talks to, uh, towards the future. It talks about the research agenda. It talks about us as the research community coming together and building on each other's work. And I think in the exercises that we did, and I think that's what, and I'm sure it is, I can see from the comments, everyone is talking about how much they absolutely loved the interactive nature of your talk, Anna. And I think it's, it's, yeah, there is so much opportunity for us to, to coll collaborate. Collaborate. <laughs> I'm losing my words now. Um, but I think, yeah, it, I mean, the paper definitely t uh, opens up um, the opportunity to do, to do that. But I know that you are interested in collaboration beyond um, what you have reported in that conference paper. So bringing it back together in terms of how we would like to collaborate and the understanding of the roles that each of us would have. Um, do you have any closing thoughts, I guess, to tie this all together? Oh, God, uh, that was a very, very hefty final thought. No, but uh, I think all the points raised are very, very thought provoking and, and extremely interesting. And, uh, and I think that's also maybe, you know, actually touches a bit on the whole, uh, you know, first part of my presentation. So what is collaboration? What do we mean with that? And that's something that I can't answer here or now because that's way too big a, que uh, a question for the last, you know, minute we have or so. But uh, that is something that I would, you know, invite everybody to, to think about. And, you know, if you have thoughts, you know, please share them in the Arcom Cafe. I think that should be open tomorrow or, you know, just email people, call them. And so that we can, as well, Libby and, and Vivian both said, that we can help each other and build on each other's work and, you know, create this thing that's much, you know, greater than, than us. In a way. And uh, yes, that's it for me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Anna. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining and participating. I can see from dropping in in my stealth mode as a spy, as Lloyd has, has mentioned, no, infiltrating no, your group. You spy, yes. that I, don't, I, I don't know. I don't mind being a spy, really. Well, <laughs> but I can see that you guys had fun. That's just, you know, it was very apparent. So without um, uh, holding us uh, uh, on for, for too much longer, I would just like to close this session. But I would like us to all 
put our hands together, please, to thank Anna for her fabulous presentation. Thank you so much. It has been a pleasure to, to share this moment with you. So have a nice Monday evening now, everybody. <laughs>